It's that time of the year again where we gather the best and most exciting track day machines in one place to find out which is fastest and which is most fun. This year, myself and Richard Meaden will talk you through each car and then sports car racer, Sebring 12 hour winner and all round top bloke, Marino Franchitti will set lap times in each. The winner might not be the fastest car here. We're looking for the biggest thrill, the widest smile, the most addictive, all enveloping experience. From hot hatches to lightweights to big bad racers, there's something here for everyone. Even a GTR for the GTR boys and girls who get very upset if they're not represented in any and every video. Even if it's a cookery show or something about natural history. So this is Track Car of the Year, held at the brilliant Blyton Park circuit. We hope you enjoy it just as much as we did. Okay, so let's kick off this track day car of the year. Right at the bottom of the food chain, in terms of power, the Caterham 160, all 80 horsepower off it. Okay, so how does this thing stack up? Forget the company it's in for a second. How does it work as a fun track day car? Well, it's, it's a weird little thing, actually. The engine revs to 7.7, but it doesn't feel that keen. The five-speed box isn't amazing. And unlike most Caterhams, you can't bully it around like you, uh, like you might in an R300 or a 620R, one of those mad things. You have to drive really, really delicately. So you sort of have to turn in and then just let the chassis move around. And if you get it right, you turn once and straighten the steering wheel and just four wheel drift through the corners. It's, when you get it right, it's really, really satisfying. I wouldn't go as far as to call it exciting, but it's really, really good fun and really satisfying. The problem comes when you try and really, really push the car. And obviously the lack of power, even on a relatively small circuit like this, is telling. And if you get too much slip angle, it's actually, you scrub a lot of speed, but you also don't feel fully, fully in control because the tires have got so little grip, you're just in the realms of momentum and you can't really do much to improve things. So it's not a racing car, but it's a bloody good way to learn about car control. And I think it's a properly sweet little car, this. <laughs> so that's it, 80 horsepower has probably never been put to better use. The Caterham is resolutely not about lap times, but if you're curious, it sets a time of 117.6. Just for reference, that's 4.8 seconds slower than a Toyota GT86, but 1.6 faster than a Morgan three-wheeler. Next up is the Megane Trophy R, which should just about be able to top that time, don't you think? So we're in the Megane Trophy R, which I'm sure you've read lots about in previous issues of the magazine. It's basically the most bonkers front wheel drive production car you can buy. It's a Nürburgring record holder. It's the latest in a long line of extreme Renault Sport hot hatches. And it's really, it lives for track work. We drove it a few months ago on our road car, car of the year test. And whilst it shone really brightly on certain roads, it's such a specific and particular driving experience <laughs> that it actually has quite major limitations on the road. But here it feels much more at home. If you like front wheel drive cars and you like the specific challenge that they present to try and make go well around a track, there's really nothing like this car for aggression and for edge. It's quite an edgy car, particularly when the tyres are coming up to temperature, which I think is quite cool actually. If you're driving a car where you feel the temperature come into the tyres and the handling balance changes, that's when you know you're in something pretty serious. It's so adjustable on the throttle and on the brakes I mean, it doesn't handle like a rear-wheel drive car, but you need to be comfortable with oversteer. 
because the rear is always mobile through fast corners and on the brakes into slow corners. I know front wheel drive isn't everyone's cup of tea and it doesn't have the purity of rear wheel drive. But still there's something quite compelling about this recipe that Renault seemed to do so well. And I think you'd have to go a long way to find a front wheel drive car that's more exciting than this. So the Megane's focus on the track makes it a rewarding, edgy car to drive at the limit. But Marino, not a fan of this car on the road, still complains of mid-corner understeer. It can't be that bad as it sets a time of 107.3, making it the fastest front driver we've tested around here by 1.4 seconds. Although that record might be very short-lived. OK, so if you hadn't already spotted it, we're in the Clio Cup race car. Pretty closely based to the road car, actually. It's 1.6 litre, four-cylinder turbo. It's a little bit more power, 220 horsepower or so versus 200 in the regular road car. It's got a six-speed sequential box, but unlike the road car, it's a proper race box, single clutch, paddle shift, and you only use the clutch pedal when you're pulling away and when you come to a halt. Otherwise, you just park your left foot to the side and brace yourself with it. The car races to a minimum weight of around 1,200 kilos with fuel and driver. And you can hear it's just an angry, buzzy, buzzy little thing, very like a modern touring car, really, which is the whole point because it's, uh, it's designed as a feeder series for up and coming touring car races. So, you know, as soon as you get in it, it feels like a serious car, but it's not so fast or grippy or intimidating that you don't feel that you can begin to push it quite soon. It feels quite stiff over the bumps, it skips around. But the diff is magic. You just put your foot down and far from running wide, the car actually pulls itself tighter. But still, you need to exercise a little bit of discipline because it's easy to just push the car to understeer and when you're chasing fractions of a second as the guys who race these are for any sort of advantage you can't afford to make the slightest mistake it's such an addictive little car to drive that you can really hustle it the clio unsurprisingly nails a superb time of 104.8 that's just a tenth shy of an r8 v10 plus for some context Marino enjoys the challenge of the car and how it could be invaluable as a learning tool for tin top racing, but thinks it's maybe a bit too much for track days alone. In stark contrast, the next car is very much a road car tweaked for occasional track use, and it looks a whole heap of fun. Right, so we've switched to the MX-5, and this car's been prepared by BBR, and it's their sort of top level turbo conversion. They've also done suspension and tyres and exhaust, so it's a complete package, but it's still very much a road car. Um, MX-5 get quite a tough time, I think, and, and perhaps rightly so in standard tune. They're, they're quite good fun, but they never quite deliver the performance that perhaps you or I would want to have from a small rear-wheel drive car. This car addresses all those issues. It really feels like a small car with big power and big torque and the throttle becomes, suddenly becomes another tool that you use to adjust the attitude of the car, which is, you know, is what we all want from a rear wheel drive car at the end of the day, isn't it? So the balance is fantastic. And because the car's so light and you don't get the inertia, you can just play around with it to your heart's content. It's seriously quick. I mean, that's without really trying. It's nudging 130 on the straight here. You could make a serious pain of yourself against some pretty quick opposition on a track day. You'd make a right nuisance of yourself. We've got some really 
full on exotic machinery for track car this year and perhaps that means an MX-5 on paper and parked in the paddock isn't the first thing you're drawn to but once you get in it it's there's very little parked up here today that's going to offer more entertainment and what's more you know the reality of track day driving for most of us is we need a car that functions as a road car maybe even an everyday road car this thing you can drive Nürburgring Spa or to your local circuit in pretty good comfort you can get to the track have a fantastic time hoon around and then assuming you've got any tyres left drive home so you know MX-5 don't underestimate them especially when they're tuned because they are so much fun and really effective track day toys by the time we're finished with the MX-5, the tyres are dead, but the sacrifice was worth it. All of us to a man love driving this thing, and Marino logs a decent lap of 108.95. Another lightweight two-seater is next, only this one doesn't have a roof, or windows, or any bodywork. Okay, so this one I've really, really, really been looking forward to. This is the Atom 3.5R. And I just love, love, love these things. So the basics of 3.5R, of course, got that more power, haven't you? So, the two litre charge cooled, supercharged engine. Now has 350 horsepower. The performance of this car is mental. This one's got Olin's dampers, Sadev, six-piece sequential pneumatic box. It's a much more serious thing. There's more weight, more bite to everything. And it's more progressive even than the one we drove last year, which was so much fun. But with this new box, the diff. A lot more dry, so rather than falling into big angles of oversteer, you seem to get just a little bit and it keeps keeps driving the car. You can slide it around like a loon, of course, but still got that incredibly manic edge. <laughs> With just a bit more control, you can just meter out the performance more accurately. Still great brakes. Feel the traction out of there is superb. Trying to sum up what this thing is like to drive quickly is pretty hard, but I guess the word that springs to mind is intense. Just the power delivery. <laughs> the new gearbox. Just the sheer amount of grip and precision that you've got on turning as well. It really is mega. I guess the only question that the Atom asks you is when is, when is too much power? The Atom is crazed, wildly accelerative and hilarious. It's also very, very fast around Blyton Park. It registers an astounding 58.9 second lap. We all hate the painful moulded seat, but otherwise it's close to perfection. How do you follow this thing? With something completely different, but no less spectacular. As you can probably hear, we're in the 991 GT3. If you've ever been to a track day, you'll know that the paddock is generally full of GT3s of various generations. This is obviously the latest iteration and it is by far the most full-on car Porsche's ever stuck a GT3 badge on I think as a non RS model I think when Porsche first launched this car and we learned that they weren't making it with a manual gearbox part of us was disappointed 
because the manual versions of the previous cars were so exciting to drive. But this, it just, with a PDK box on track, it just takes things to a whole new level of aggression and control and it's just such an intense thing to drive it's an angry car you really need to hang on to the thing but like most Porsches it only really does what you tell it to and once you get used to the weight distribution and the traction you have geez it's such an exciting car and the way it revs this eight and a half nine thousand upshift at nine just totally addictive and you can't quite believe this is a road car with registration plates on it like all good track cars it just feels like it could do this all day you're not really taking much out of the machinery other than the tires there's no doubt these cars are big money and they're a big big financial commitment to run as a track day toy but my god I can't imagine many cars that give you a bigger hit for every pound you spend so the Porsche is intense and shockingly effective but also a hugely rewarding and entertaining car Marino rings its neck to record a 101.9 and marvels at the agility provided by the rear wheel steering and of course that engine now comes the grudge match bit Ready GTR fans and haters, it's the turn of the Nismo. So of all the road cars we've got here at Track Car of the Year, I think it's safe to say the GTR Nismo is the car that I've been most intrigued to drive. There's a real mystique and an aura about Nismo products and this, this car is every bit as aggressive and exciting just to look at it in the paddock it looks like a bit of a monster of all the cars we've got here it's probably most closely aligned with a 991 gt3 it'll be fascinating to see what sort of lap times marino gets out of the cars but from a just from how they feel they couldn't be more different really despite the way it looks the steering is actually quite light which gives you a certain impression of agility and there's immense grip and traction but it's a big big car to throw around you can feel the weight and you can feel the car almost fighting itself to get the traction and to contain its mass and it's you can feel the car working hard and there's a certain satisfaction in that <laughs> so whilst you feel how effective the hardware is in in this GTR you can also feel how hard it's having to work. <laughs> to contain the weight and to propel it and to slow it down and stop it in the braking areas. You really wouldn't want to be this car's brake discs or tyres. Is this really working the living daylights out of them? Is it as much fun as a GT3? I don't think so. I think if you're a fundamentalist kind of GTR fan, then there's no other car for you. But if you're relatively impartial, I think this is a quite a brutal device. Where the 911 is a more finely tuned machine. So for me, it's the 991. What the stopwatch says is an entirely different thing. 
Based purely on entertainment, the GT3 beats the GTR then. But what about against the watch? Marino is mighty impressed with its stability, traction and by how much better it is at the turning phase than other GTRs. But it can't quite eclipse the GT3, logging a 102.1, two agonising tenths off the pace. And now there's another road car threatening to go much, much quicker than both. OK, this is where things start to feel pretty serious. This is the Radical RXC Turbo. It's like a little Le Mans prototype, but this is their Radical's road car. They do a V8 race car version. So this is Radical's idea of a usable road car. And you've got love them for it, really. We've got a three and a half litre V6. Twin turbo, 450 horsepower, 500 pound foot of torque. This thing weighs just over a ton, about 1,050 kilos. It sounds incredibly intimidating, that whole recipe, but actually it's not. You just have to get your head around how quickly you can corner in these things with the downforce. And when you do that, it's so addictive. Just going round, getting quicker and quicker, but it's still quite drivable. Now we had one of these last year, which didn't have the turbo engine, it was a 3.7 Ford engine as well from the Mustang. And that car had a real adjustability about it. This car doesn't quite have that. I think it's obviously a, a setup issue. It's a bit more understeer and it's a bit snappier when it does start to oversteer. It's not quite as good on the brakes as that car was as well last year. But the performance is mega through these fast corners. I think it's flat through here. I'm not quite going to hold it flat. Okay, so the strong points of this car, well, the sheer sense of excitement you get being in a car that looks like this, this view out. The seven speed Quave box, it just makes you feel like a racing driver. And the good stuff, well, the traction is absolutely mega. The high speed grip is pretty mind bending, actually. So if this was a racing car, I think there's still things that you'd want to tweak on the setup, make it quicker. And as a track day car, I think I'd like it to be a bit pointier, so it was more fun. But bloody hell, it's so exciting driving this thing quick. The Radical is quite something. It didn't feel perfectly set up for this track and the throttle response of the old naturally aspirated engine is much missed. Even so, the high speed grip is phenomenal, as is the traction and braking. It sets a time of 1 minute 0.4 with the magic of downforce. The next car has the magic of a V8, a really, really loud V8. Just listen to this thing. If you don't want to drive this car, you are basically dead. Please leave our channel right now. be writing about this car racing at Le Mans in the World Sports Car Championship because this car was the weapon of choice for privateer racers who wanted to do battle against the likes of Ferrari and Porsche. Well now in 2014 Broadly Automotive have decided to rebuild the T70. To exactly the blueprint of the original car for historic racing. And my God, what an extraordinary car. of an engine you can hear is a 
a five litre Chevy race engine. And it's good for comfortably more than 500 horsepower. And the car weighs comfortably under a ton. Consuming the noise, the speed, the G-force. My God! My God! <laughs> what a beast! I've never driven anything as addictive as this car. It's terrifying to be around and it's intimidating to look at and if you can get confident with it it's just your best friend. It's so hard to describe. Oh. Hybrid supercars might be the future, but nothing, nothing gets better than this thing. It's hard to sum up the Broadley T76 in a few words, so I won't bother trying. Instead, I'll just tell you that this car, engineered in the 1960s, remember, sets a lap time of 58.3 seconds. What a machine. For around £50,000 less than the quarter of a million pound T76, you could have a McLaren 650S Sprint. This car isn't road legal, think of it as the ultimate track day 650S that you can race to, should you feel like you've progressed as far as you can on track days. It retains the engine, box, brake steer and proactive chassis control suspension system from the road car, but everything is optimised for pure track work, and it runs 19 inch slick tyres. It's a really, really impressive car and runs to 155 miles an hour down the back straight before setting a lap time of 57.5 seconds. But fabulous as the 650S Sprint is, it's really just the warm-up act for this thing. Proper monster. Oh my god. Okay, so we drove the Can Am before last year, which was effectively a 12 c GT3 with a bit more aero and a lot more power. This, this car has got a lot less power than that, so 500 ish horsepower. It has to conform to GT3 rolls, but it's got a lot more aero. And the 650S is a massive, massive development from the 12C. The focus was really on more performance, obviously. Better front end grip, but also making it easier for amateurs to handle, more drivable. So that's dickheads like me, basically. In fact, no, it's not. It's dickheads like me with a shitload more money. <laughs> So how does it feel as a distinctly amateur driver? Ah, oh, it's absolutely awesome. I love it. So what are the overriding impressions of this car? <laughs> well, the grip, you can feel it popping through there. It's generating so much grip through the high speed stuff. It's absolutely fundamental. More than that, like all racing cars, it's the brakes. The brakes are unbelievable. And it just gives you so many options on the way into corners. The nose is really pinned. So you can just hold a tight line, get on the power, get on the curve, short shift here, and let the engine go. Oh. So 
too late. It's insane. I just chuck it in. It certainly feels secure for someone like me. I don't want to take too many liberties with it. But I feel like I can drive it and actually exploit some of its potential, which is just wicked. Feel the understeer, feel the odd teeny bit of um, oversteer, but the traction catches the worst of that. It's so good. And no matter how late you think you're braking, it's not late enough. Come on. Yeah, man. Proper, proper, proper car. I need to be rich. I always knew that. Now I know it even more. So the 650S GT3 is just huge fun. Intoxicating and manic and yet controllable and approachable. I love it and Marino is massively impressed by the leap on from the 12C GT3 which he raced previously. In the end, it clocks a 55.8 second lap, comfortably the fastest of the day. The standout lap times are that of the Broadly, imagine if this thing was on slicks, and the 991 GT3 just edging the Nismo. But fastest or not, the 650S GT3 is not our track car of the year. Of the mad, crazy, money no object stuff, the Broadly T76 is just more evocative and even more unforgettable. The Porsche 991 GT3 almost took the title, it's just so complete and as an all-purpose road and track car, it's untouchable. But in the end, the rabid, physical, screaming Atom 3.5R just had to be the winner. It's just an insanely enjoyable car and a thrill that could never, ever wear off. We love this thing and that is the end of it. <laughs>